of transition. Everybody say transition. Uh, transition is very important in the church world. It always happens. It happens in business. It happens in school. It happens in families. Transitions is the changing through life. And transitions can take place better if you have plenty of oil. Everybody know what I'm talking about? You got that Holy Ghost oil there, and the transition can take place because what's going to happen with transition comes friction. And uh, when friction takes place, some folk get a little uh, messed up. So in my place as your pastor is to help you understand that and get you prepared. You know, when I text with David Clowers this morning, you know, that was a part of it. We got a, uh, I talked with text yesterday with Mike Easterlin. He's going to be in the second service. He's our normal drummer. Now we've got another drummer. As you can see, there's transitions that take place. It's so important in your life that you learn how to uh, appreciate the leadership of this house and know that as we move through transitions, we're making the best choices we can. We don't have a lot of camps already this summer, which bothers me because a lot of the camps we did have pulled out and bought another camp. You know, so uh, that also is a situation for me and for our leadership to deal with as we move. So we got other things. We're starting a garden out at the camp, uh, going to turn uh, the arena into a, uh, a garden, which for the community is going to be a blessing for homemade tomatoes and vine ripe watermelons and no broccoli. <laughs> Amen. So uh, I asked Frank about it. He said, I don't even know how to grow broccoli. I said, I don't even know how they grow it either. I don't even know where it comes from. I just know that it's not good. <laughs> I don't care how much cheese you put on it. Hey, man, it's just there's certain things you just, if you got to wrap it like that, it's, it's not worth it. Hallelujah. God's biggest obstacle. Does God have an obstacle? When God who creates the world, His voice in the beginning, was the word and the word spoke and the world was does god have an obstacle yes he does your will your will is god's biggest obstacle what he decided that he was going to give you free will the angels don't have free will when the angels disobeyed god in heaven the archangel lucifer was thrown out along with probably around a third of the angels that later became demons. Anybody follow where I'm going? And understanding that, the rest of the angels obey God. I don't know where that came from. Heaven's listening. So as you look at it, you recognize that the other angels, they obey God. When God speaks, they go. They come to earth. They speak, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace and goodwill toward men. But then when God created you, sir, he created man in the wilderness, put a little wild in his heart, created woman in the garden. She loves to tend things. There's something about the way God created us. But the one thing he put inside of us he didn't put in the angels was a free will. You didn't have to be here this morning. You got up and made a decision. You don't have to go to heaven unless you're a Baptist. They have to go anyway. How many found that out? Found out a long time ago. When you're Baptist, you're always saved. So no matter what the hell you do, you're going to heaven. <laughs> I struggle a little bit with that one, Tommy. Your will is so important. Your will. It's free. So God looks at us and he says, I'm going to give you a choice. You, you make your choice. You want to serve me or not. We can't pray the Lord's will come until our will goes. We have to submit. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Three times he prayed. This is God wrapped in flesh, and he prayed, not my will, but your will be done. Three times. And he finally gave in, and he went to the cross for us. If Jesus struggles with his will, it says, not my will. How much more do we struggle with ours? When you got up this morning, you thought, I don't know. I think I might stay in bed a little while longer. Amen. And then you just realized if you did, you'd be a little uglier when you got here. <laughs> so you had to get up and make up. Can I get an amen, sir? Amen. 
First Peter 2, 5. Peter reminds us that God does not build with bricks, but God builds with stones. Is there an issue there? Absolutely. If you got bricks, I can lay bricks. We can send men and women down to Guatemala to build houses with bricks. Amen. You just put brick on top of brick on top of brick on top of brick. Bricks are uniform. They all look the same. Wouldn't it be something if everybody in this house looked like HD? <laughs> Amen. That little gray on top. Little bubble in the middle. <laughs> Balanced man. Sure is. Sure is. Wouldn't it be something? Or, or maybe we look around and realize that everybody here has got to look the same. But yet I look out and you don't look like bricks to me. You look like stones. Stones are different. Peter said, and you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. So God takes these stones. Look at it. Let's keep reading this. It ain't over yet. Next slide. Is it stuck? There it is. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. That's more. You are his holy priest. Through the me meditation of Jesus, mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifice that are pleasing unto God. So when I read this, I realize we are lively stones. Lively stones. Eh, bricks, uniformed, don't move. They just stay in place. Lively stones, some of us had to be smoothed out just to fit with others. Amen. We're a little jagged. We're a little messed up. If you watch somebody work with stones, they often take off the edges and, and they work on it and they fit them together. And some of you say, well, I, I don't fit. Well, I don't mean this mean. Maybe you don't belong here. Well, I can't pastors say that. But if you feel like you fit, you found your church. If you found your pastor, you found your connections. Maybe, maybe the, fact, the fact you don't fit on this side, maybe you need to move to this side. Amen. Or vice versa. Can I get an amen? amen? I ain't saying the person you're next to you don't like. I know you live with them, but either way, I'm glad you're here. We're lively stones. Say it again. Lively, lively stones. But now listen. When you get born again, see, the thing with uniformity is, is they all have the same personality. Amen. They all look the same with uniformity. But stones have different personalities. And when you were born again, you have your, God gave you a personality. Amen. He gave you some of you extroverts, some of you introvert, some of you are, are way outlandish, and some of you are extremely plaid. It's okay. It's all right to be who you are. And God created us that way. So you didn't, we, we, you didn't lose your personality when you gained your identity in Christ. So if we're stubborn stones that refuse to be set in place with our fellow stones, then God's dream of unity can't be achieved. God's trying to achieve, achieve unity, so he puts us together and connects us. And for the loss of a dream, listen to me, for the loss of a dream, God still refuses to violate your will. God still refuses to force you to be his child. God still refuses to force you to go to heaven. God still refuses to force you to sit with other believers. He won't do it because it's your will. Because when you give in, when you give in to your will, it's like then, it's like you, you, you understand it as, as guardians and, and parents and grandparents. When your kid finally gives in, it's like, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Whoa, that's crying time right there, man. When, they, when you don't have to force them to keep carrying out the trash and making their bed, amen, and doing the right things and picking up their laundry and washing their own clothes and dishes, amen, and washing a car that you paid big money for. I'm just getting this out. When they finally have, it's a wonderful thing. See, disunity, the issue is always control. Unity will be born when we submit our wills to the Father and give Him full control of our hearts, our lives, and our churches. Unity is born then. Disunity flourishes in any atmosphere where human wills reign. Pride shows up. When we struggle and fight for control, it destroys any hope of unity among us. That's what happened in heaven. That unity was there, but then Lucifer rose up and he decided, I will be above God. So disunity starts in heaven. Amen. God cast him out, cast out the, the demons. Amen. The angels who became demons. When he did that, unity now has flourished in heaven for ever since then. But look on earth. Disunity happens when we say, I want my will. 
and what I want to see happen. And, and when you know your place in the house of God, in, in the church world, it eliminates competition. I've always known I'm the pastor. I've never walked in here and I wonder, who's the pastor? I know people walk in here and look at me and go, well, who's the pastor? <laughs> and that's okay. All you got to watch is just a little bit my gift to come through. Because I'm telling you, that's what God called me to be. So when you know your place, it eliminates competition. I don't come up here and push Josiah out of the way and say, excuse me, let me have that guitar. Be the dumbest thing you've ever heard. <laughs> it don't happen. So disunity flourishes where human wills reign. When we struggle and fight for control of, you know, I counted up by Wednesday night, we had 11 meetings the little country church did out of Sis and Swap and, and Forge and, and, and Quench and, and all the different meetings that we have. That doesn't include our children's churches and churches here, amen, and all, even the funerals. We had a lot of meetings just last week. So there's opportunity to get together, but it's important that our wills uh, submit to His. Can I get an amen? amen? Listen to me. New believers can quickly wither and die in divisive atmosphere. I've been in churches where there was division in houses, and what I'm doing is just called preventive maintenance. Anybody take vitamins this morning? I did. You know why I took them? I even got my wife looking for Geritol. That's some of that old-timey stuff. When I was a kid, we only had two things in the house for medicine, Geritol and Mercurochrome. <laughs> Amen. Mercurochrome, monkey's blood, was for any cut, scrapes, anything, burn like fire. Don't drink yet. And then you took Geritol. Tastes like liquid iron. Did you know they still make this stuff? Found it on Amazon. I don't know how old it is, but it's still there. <laughs> Listen to me. New believers, quickly. They can't, you know, if you're just new in Christ and you go to a church that's divisive and there's no unity, there's no laughter, there's no fun, there's nobody fellowship, who wants to stay in that? I wouldn't want to be there. Even that's why this house has is so much fun. Both churches, both of our churches are almost full on both Sunday mornings. So what is that? There's unity in the house. And that's a good thing. It means our wills are given. In Philippians chapter 2, Jesus set aside his divinity. When he came from heaven to earth, the scripture, uh, Philippians, Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or in, vain, or in vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Amen. Give in and allow people to be blessed. Exalt somebody else instead of yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. The Message Bible says it like this. Think of yourselves the way Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God. Amen. But didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredible, humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death, that crucifixion. Verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. There's nobody like Jesus. I mean, he's in the kingdom. Amen. He's running the kingdom and he sets aside his divinity. He comes to earth in the womb of a woman named Mary. Amen. At that moment, he's a little a, a vulnerable baby child. He lives 33 years on earth and died for us. Why don't we exalt his name right now? Hallelujah. I love Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, give bless the Lord in this house. God exalted him. Why did God exalt him? Because he humbled himself. You want to understand a tremendous principle. God always exalts the humble and humbles the exalted. When you think you're all this, pride comes before the fall. So what causes disunity, pastor, selfish ambition? You're more interested in advancing yourself than the kingdom of God. Prestige, amen, a false sense of respect not earned. Today we have this, this ball game that's going to take place tonight. And $9,000 for a minimum ticket, $3 million for a suite. Amen. All the wealthiest of the wealthy are trying to get in. Everybody wants to be served. Everybody wants to be coddled. coddled. Everybody wants to be looked after. Listen to me. That's not the spirit of Jesus. Amen. I'm almost to the point where I want to throw up and I don't even want to watch a game. I used to love a good football game, but all of a sudden this here, the game is kind of secondary. To every, the only thing I'm concerned about in that game is the commercials. I mean, I, I might skip the game, tape it, and just flip through the game just to see the commercials. One of my favorite Super Bowl commercials was a guy sitting in Louisiana rocking in a chair. 
and a big old mosquito come up and started to get on his leg. And the man took Tabasco sauce and put it on a cracker. <laughs> took a bite of that cracker and that mosquito got a big old suck of that blood. As he began to fly off, he went <laughs> My favorite commercial. It reminded me that, you know, when a mosquito bites you and flies away, they sing, there's power in the blood. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 That's where the power is, self-centered. If life is a competition to be won, then others in the race are enemies. Hmm. Not co-laborers. Let me tell you about Jesus, the super savior we got. Napoleon said this of Jesus. He said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ was no mere man. Between him and whoever else in the world there is, there's no possible term of comparison. Even Napoleon understood it. Today, celebrity preachers, I get sent these little TikToks and videos of preachers, big stages, and a lot of them now, it's not even about church, it's just about being on the internet. It's say, hey, look at me, the, the, the promotions of all of this, and, and uh, I've never seen so many wannabe celebrity preachers as I have today. You know, to me, a pastor ought to be able to go to the hospital and see people. He ought to be able to do funerals. He ought to be able to do weddings. He ought to be able to be with the people, not run off in a back room after church and have an entourage lead him out to his Cadillac. I hope this gets online. See, what happens in preachers, they think they big shot. You know what a big shot is? That's a little shot away from home. That's a big shot. A lot of preachers think they're experts. They're experts in, in theology. They're experts in eschatology, the last days and revelation. They, they're experts in Hebrew. They're experts in Greek. An ex is a has-been. A pert is a drip under pressure. Expert. A has been drip under pressure. <laughs> Some are model celebrity preachers. A model is a small replica of the real thing. Come on, preacher. <laughs> <laughs> I preached my first revival in Channel View, Texas. They put it up on the overhead. I'll never forget it. I was a young man, Pastor Joseph. I was probably 22, 23 years old. They had it up there. They put it up there. At that time, we didn't have these flashing signs and stuff. They just put it up there in their big black letters. Come here, Jerry Hovada's unique preaching style. Oh, man. Young man, I was so excited because they, they called me unique. I was, oh, jeez. They called me unique. I preached a house fire, man. I ran on pews. I, I did that. I mean, we had us a time. Hallelujah. They gave me enough money at that, listen, at that revival to pay off my first uh, 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 set of semester. Amen. I paid it off just preaching that one revival. I said, unique. Listen to Pastor Jerry's unique preaching style. So I'm on my way to college and I'm listening to the radio and I'm listening to my favorite preacher. His name was Paul Harvey. And Paul Harvey said, if you don't know whether to call somebody good or bad, call them unique. <laughs> my head went from this to this. So if you ever hear me say, that's some unique singing there. That's some unique cooking you got there. That sure is a unique dress you're wearing. Amen. If you ever hear me say that, you don't know whether I'm saying good or bad. Just leave me alone. Amen. Jesus described himself as gentle and humble. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. That's what I'll do. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, and I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That means he's carrying the yoke. You're getting the light side of it. The word gentle there is strength under control. That's who Jesus was. Amen. Humble, lowly. Word picture is a helper. Unselfishness and thoughtfulness. Jesus, that's all about him. He was he had his strength under control. He was a helper, unselfish. Jesus' self-description was verified by his obedience. In other words, he walked the talk. When he said it, then he did it. Amen. Obedience. And obedience is a servanthood. Listen, when you are obedient to God, it changes the atmosphere. i got to walk through this very quickly. I can see. Number one, let me tell you something here. Our ability to create unity, unity is directly related to our ability to be a servant. Yeah. 
If you want unity in your family, if you want unity in your business, if you want unity in your church, if you want unity in your school, be a servant. I don't care what anybody else says. Don't look better than, pick it up. You walk by paper, you pick it up. If I can help somebody, I'm going to help you. If i got to walk you out to the car, we'll walk, I'm going to serve you. And when you serve people, it immediately begins to create unity. Amen. It brings folk together. See, here's what we do. Response to spiritual influence creates atmosphere. I've been preaching this one thought for years. Response to spiritual influence creates atmosphere. When Moses saw the burning bush, amen, there autom automatically there became a, a, an atmosphere. Atmosphere sustained creates climate. One thing, if we create an atmosphere in here, it will start a climate. Atmosphere is a response to a spiritual influence, which when sustained creates a climate. Listen, sustaining one day of warmth in December does not constitute climate change. Are you hearing me? One warm day in December, don't you start screaming climate change. Because that doesn't mean nothing. It's South Texas. It's just the way it is here. Amen. Climate maintained creates strongholds. When you maintain a climate, when Jesus rules, it will create a stronghold in an area such as Crosby, East Texas, this area. When Jesus becomes Lord, it creates a stronghold. When I say stronghold, not even devils can get through it. Because people are now serving one another and loving one another. I want you to think about it. It's amazing what some people think. And if you can ch change people's thinking, thinking, their lives will change. But the thinking's got to change. You know, if you're raised in an atmosphere that allows you to respond to the predominant spirit in the Middle East, Muslim, Hamas, ISIS, Buddhist, amen. If you're raised a certain way, it, what happens is it creates a culture. And that culture, what women have to wear these headscarves. They, they get put down. They get uneducated. You know, I had a face talk the other day with my daughter, Jill, who's in a, a, in a, a Muslim country. <coughs> we talked about all of this. And you understand there's a climate there. When Jesus becomes Lord in an area, all of a sudden freedom takes place and people start serving one another. It's not about big eyes and little use. Amen. And then you look at others. Why, why do atheists think the way they do? Or, or how about in the Christian world, uh, within the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Mormons? It is the attitude that is sustained that creates a stronghold. Stronghold sustained creates a culture. If I can sustain a stronghold, it'll create a culture. People come here and they say, the culture here is different in the little country church. If you were with me in Alabama... And you saw my culture in Alabama, and this is not, when you take a culture, it'll be in a little Petri dish. There's a little culture in there, all right? You grow that culture, and it becomes what is in there. And what happened in this house and in this place over the last 30, 40 years, there was a culture being developed. And as that culture began to be developed, misfits began to fit. Holy wild thinking began to set in. People started taking risk. People quit using the word safety as much. Amen. Folks started stepping out. Amen. Getting their own business, starting their own job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, buying their own houses, owning stuff instead of renting. Hear me? Can I get an amen? Amen. This is a culture we created here. It's a particular society that has its own beliefs, way of life. Amen. A way of thinking and behaving. So it's important. What is it we say right here? We're here to win. W-I-N. Winning the loss, integrating the body, nurturing people. I never forget that. That's not a saying to me. That's the way I live. I want to win people to Jesus. I'm always about winning people. You know what I told the church here? I mean, uh, the funeral here. Connie, did you hear me say it on, on the other day during uh, Mike's funeral, his home going? I told the people there, don't come to this church. We're full. <laughs> Sir, you got your hand up in the back. You showed up. Thank you. Amen. Several of you from the funeral showed up. You, you realized I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> That's called, uh, what, the, what, what do we call that? Reverse psychology. I don't know much about forward psychology, but I know a whole bunch about reverse. <laughs> what I'm doing, I want to win people to Jesus before it's too late. I want to integrate the body, bring it together. I want people to be nurtured, and that's what all our little meetings do. Now we're in John chapter 13. It was just, I'm going to start in verse 1. I'll find you in verse 3. It's just before Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to, for him to leave the world. I just want God to give me a heads up before I go. I miss my friend Toby Keith already. I believe he had a heads up. I just want a heads up. 
for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. To understand this moment, the roads of that time were winding dirt trails, turning to mud in the rain. Most of the people there wore sandals. The custom for the host is to provide a slave to wash the feet of the dinner guest. If no slave, then one of the earliest guests or the owner of the home would graciously do it. And it's interesting that none of the disciples volunteered for this lowly task. The room was filled with proud hearts and dirty feet, willing to fight for the throne, but nobody wanted to fight for the towel. Everybody just wants to be the leader. Everybody wants to be on top. It was Peter, it was James, it was John, it was Judas. There's a whole crew of people in here. There's 12. And then Jesus smells the stench of their feet. They're laying, not sitting at a table, but they're laying head to foot, head to foot, head to foot, all the way around. So what you've got is your dish and their feet. You could smell the toe jam as it begins to permeate through the building. Amen. Jesus smelt it. Hallelujah. And then he decides, I got to teach y'all one more thing. Because there's so much disunity in this room. Judas is fixing to betray him. I I've named this message not just another Super Bowl. If you don't get it, I can't help you. Jesus never said, man, now I'm going to demonstrate servanthood to you. I'm going to demonstrate it. Watch my humility in action. Stick out your feet. See, that was the Pharisees. That was their way. They often announced their humility. They announced their giving. They announced their fasting. They announced their praying. Hey, look at me. They were reclining and eating. So if you had your feet that way, your neighbor knew it. You see, it ain't our feet today. It's our pride. It's our arrogance. It's our nose in the air. It's our refusal to reach out, shake hands, hug, greet. Tell, ask somebody, are you hurting? Amen. This week, Pastor Joseph and I went and visited a lady whose husband is dying. I, I have dropped, I dropped the ball. I forgot. Out of sight, out of mind. I forgot. And then it hit me how much I love this family. And I went over and I, I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I need you to hear me. I apologize. I'm sorry. As a pastor, I should have already been here. He's passing from this life. He's there on the bed. And she looked at me and she said, no, I know you're busy. I said, no, ma'am, I am not busy. I've not been busy in 20-something years. Amen. What I should have been is over here to see you. And she received my apology. <sighs> you see, uh, this thing that we do in ministry at times, some of us make it look real easy, but it's hard because you love people. And you see that pride can get in the way. and You can get arrogant and, and thank you all that because you're the pastor or you're the leader of a ministry or, or you, you look prettier than, than your husband I hope so <laughs> listen when you know your strength Jesus understood he came from the father and that God had put all things under his feet he knew where he was from you are not from your mother's womb you are not from Louisiana you are not from Alabama you are not from Texas you can say all that, and you can puff up if you want to, but you are from heaven. 
God had a thought about you, found a place to put you here and to get you here. <clears throat> and if you were born in Texas, you can be as prideful as you can be, but don't be too prideful. I'm from Alabama. I don't make a real big deal of that. So he knew where he was from. He knew where he was going. I'm going back to be with the Father. You know where you're going. You're going back to be with the Father. It takes away the arrogance of this moment. I'm going to tell you, we all can wash anyone's feet. There's no inferiority. Being a servant includes being gracious. Sometimes it's harder to receive. If I was to walk down here and look at my son-in-law and say, son-in-law, take your boots off and wash his feet, I want to promise you something. He would be reluctant because of who I am to him. Amen. They're, they're, it's harder to receive sometimes than to give. Amen. And some of us need to swallow our pride. If somebody wants to bless you with something, take the blessing. Amen. If somebody wants to serve you, let them serve you. Amen. Especially if somebody has just been a, a knucklehead. Maybe they got a revelation. Maybe this church service hit them this morning. Amen. They just say, you know what? I think it may be time to start serving people. Being a servant is not a sign of weakness. It's incredible strength. Some folk just can't do it. They can't serve. They, they, want, to be, they want to be in the center of the stage. They want to uh, be up there in the booth waving during the football game. <laughs> look at Jesus. He came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, look, he, he, Peter didn't want to receive it. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to receive this. Verse 6, you are going to wash my feet? Are, are you going to wash my feet? So evidently Jesus went around and washed everybody's feet. But when he got to Peter, Peter said, you, you go, you go wash my feet? Do you not realize that I am doing? Jesus said, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus had answered, unless I wash your feet, you don't have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, wash my hands, wash my hands. There was a certain excitement. There was, certain, there was a moment there when Jesus said, listen, unless I wash your feet, me and you ain't getting along. Me and you ain't connected. Then Peter said, oh, well, hold on. I got to be with you, Jesus. Wash my hands, wash my hands. Jesus, I ain't giving you no bath. I ain't washing all of you, you cotton picker. Listen to me, boy. All you need wash is that which comes in contact with the world. What comes in contact with the world is your feet. What comes come in contact with the world now is your head, your mind. Amen. Your mind is inundated with the world. It's free. You can't sleep at night. You got this brain chatter going on inside your head. God, wash me. Start reading your Bible. Ephesians says, by the washing of the water of the word. It's the word that washes me. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against you. Amen. It's the word. It's the word of God that washes over when the world is beating you, knocking you down. The waves are coming over you. Run to the word. Get into the Psalms. Get in, get in, get in deep inside there and realize, God, I need your word. Let it wash me. Remind me to take the towel and be a blessing to others. Amen. Do, do what you call me to do. See, being a servant may mean confrontation and strong words at times. Listen, I'm going to serve you whether you like it or not. You hear me? I'm going to serve you whether you like me or not. I'm going to be right up in your face and serving you. There ain't nothing like breaking pride when you serve somebody that's arrogant. Amen. Especially when you know you better than they are. And I don't mean better in an in a arrogant sense. You're just better with your abilities and your giftings. And they think they got it. See, mentoring, when you mentor, it takes one to know one, to show one, to grow one. If you're going to mentor somebody, it takes one to know one. You've got to get to know people. Amen. You've got to connect with them. Don't tell me you're a mentor and you don't know who you're mentoring. Amen. And then you've got to show them. You've got to show them what by, by example. You've got to show them by example. And then you grow one. This is how you mentor. This is how you grow business. This is how you, you work through life. This parent, listen, parents, you need to know your kids. You need to show your kids and grow your kids. Amen. This is how we do it. So Jesus did this. It's buy-in. Everybody say buy-in. You got to buy in. If you're going to stay in this church, we've got, we've got new people I, I see showing up. And this I tell them all the time. Show up, pray up, and give up. How are you going to become a member? Show up, pray up, and give up. Well, I got a letter from the other church. Good, keep it. I show up, pray up, and give up. I don't know what to do with those letters, okay? So you show up, 
You pray up and you give up. You do it three times. By that time, you become a member because you just become part of the body. It's, it's just good to be here. So influence is when we as followers, we buy in. So at this moment, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. He said, do you understand what I've done for you, Jojo? What I've done for you, he asked him, you call me teacher and Lord, rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. See, when Jesus made the statement, verse 12, do you know what I have done for you? What he's saying is, now go change the atmosphere. Go change the atmosphere. What's made the little country church the church we are? We serve one another. We look after one another. We care for one another. There's, uh, we hurt when others hurt. We rejoice when others rejoice. So then he says, now you go do as I do. See, I have been places and uh, been in churches where they have foot washings. <sighs> I've had four surgeries on this foot. I really don't want anybody to see it. I stumble with it. I fall with it. The other foot's starting to drop now. I struggle with it. Play around the golf the next day, I can barely move. You got to keep pressing on because it's the only way I know to do it. And I'll go to churches and they'll say, take you, you know, some of y'all got such pretty feet. Katie kicked your shoes off a while ago, I noticed. <laughs> That's my daughter. Don't think anything bad, all right? No, her since she's a pup. Now, listen, pretty feet. Some of y'all got some pretty feet. If I was to announce that next week we're going to have foot washing, Shoot, you men would go get pedicures. <laughs> <laughs> Your old gnarly toes, you'd have them trimmed up. You'd be someplace going, you got pretty feet. <laughs> you got boyfriend? <laughs> go to, go to the, my last slide, please. I got to close this. Is that my last slide? Okay. Th this thing that Jesus did, foot washing today, is not about washing your feet. It's about washing which comes in contact with the world. And if I want to serve you, if I want to wash your feet, I'll wash your car. I'll mow your grass. I'll babysit your dog. That's how you wash somebody's feet. You want to win a neighbor? Do something for the neighbor. Be a blessing to them. And those down the road from you, those around you, and watch what God does. And think about it. You just washed their feet. You humbled yourself. Doggone it. That's their side of the fence. Their fence is falling down. I know it faces in my yard, but it's there. If you was to go to your neighbor and say, excuse me, neighbor, you mind if I help you with our fence? It divides our house. And all of a sudden, you just want a neighbor. Amen. You just want one over. When I was a young believer as a youth pastor, I mowed my neighbor's yard. Some of you remember the story. He was a big black man. I was one of the few white families in this black community. My first home to buy in this area over in the C.E. King area. And I was I was mowing my front yard with a push mower. I said I was a youth pastor. When you're a youth pastor, you ain't got a riding mower. <laughs> sure ain't got them zero turns that we got now. I had a push mower. I'm pushing my yard, mowing my yard. I heard a voice say, mow his grass. I said, get behind me, devil. <laughs> then I heard another voice say it again, mow his grass. And then it hit me. The devil would never ask me to do something nice for my neighbor. Amen. So I said, God, you know that he works a night shift. He's sleeping. His name is Don. And if I wake him up, this is not going to go well. So I started down at the front of the road, hoping that I could gradually move to his front yard, front door without him. Not me disturbing him. Wasn't doing it for my own glory. Doing it because God said mow his grass. 
I mowed his grass, and as I got close to the front door, he came outside with his two daughters, and he stared at me. And he said, what are you doing? I thought it was obvious. <laughs> I said, I'm mowing your grass. He said, why? Big guy, scary guy. All right, God, this on you. Because God told me to. He smiled. He said, yeah, right. He went back in the house, got his wife, came back out, and they watched me till I finished. <laughs> I ran out of gas. I asked him, do you have any gas? He said, yeah. I said, I need to get your backyard. I mowed his backyard. We became friends. I had another lady moving across from me. I think her name was like Olivia, something like that. Single, elderly, black lady. I'm mowing her yard because God told me to. She came outside, looked at me, and said, Hey, <laughs> help yourself. <laughs> when I got done, she said, she said, Can I get you a beer? <laughs> I said, No, ma'am, but we got opportunity to talk. A few months after that, I went to jail <laughs> for protesting against abortion. While I was in jail, Don and that other neighbor watched my house. My house was broken into. And during that break-in, they stopped them from stealing all my stuff, including the TV that had the vice grips on it to change the channel. I did tell you I was a youth pastor, right? Yeah, okay. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Change the atmosphere, Jesus. We want to climb it that makes you the strong man in this area. We're your servants, your sons and daughters. Remind us, God, that arrogance does not breed unity. That pride is an original sin. Forgive us for being prideful. Forgive us for acting better than those around us. Help us to humble ourselves and reach out to those around us and to, and to take a Super Bowl and wash the feet of our neighbors and friends and family and serve one another in Jesus' name. Keep your heads bowed just for a moment. If you've been away from God, put your hand up. You don't have to come up here. Just put your hand up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. My goodness, there's four or five hands. Just hold those hands up. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. This is my day. Come into my life. Make things right. I want to serve you and love you forever. God, I thank you. Make me your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Oh. Amen. Not just another Super Bowl. If I get our servant leaders to come up, I've gone a little long. That's all right. They always wait on me out there. We've got to change the time out there. It sure ain't 1030. It ain't been 1030 in years. Amen. If you've got a tithing offer, an envelope in front of you. I've talked to you about being generous, about being good stewards, about your tithing. If you're tithing, it's your training wheels, man. It's to help you get started and to learn to be a giver. To our guests that are here, thank you for coming. Amen. Please stop by our bookstore back there. Lucinda, we might have some folk that need a Bible. They may need something from that bookstore. We've got a lot of cool stuff. Amen. If you want to uh, pick up something back there, pick it up. If we can help you in any way, shape, fashion, or form, just ask Lucinda in the bookstore, I, I need that. I need that Bible. I need this, that, and the other. We'll help you out. Uh, again, look at our schedule. I, will, I don't see this on there, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. In February, I'm, I'm trying to remember, when we got Johnny here? 17th and 18th, Johnny Rollette will be with us. Amen. The 17th, uh, he'll be with us at a men's breakfast out at the ranch. And then on the 18th, Johnny will be with us. And again, if you don't remember, John, Johnny was an amazing minister. Great singer. Unbelievable. Uh, a lot of his encouragement came through our friend Ken Holloway. So we're excited about having Johnny with us on the 17th and 18th. That's two announcements we need to make. So as we say this, believe it with your heart, okay? As we give today, we're believing God for... More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail.
Loans, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Y'all give Pastor Joseph a hand.